do you know of any potential artists who are out there with talent who haven't taken the steps to cultivate that talent? Because I'm so confident there are lots of people out there who have the ability to be creative in any other field and they, they don't, they don't recognize it. And for whatever it is, reason they don't cultivate it. Yeah. That's a great question, Matt. I think that's, that's probably very true of a lot of fields uh, of endeavor where there are lots of kids growing up who for one reason or another have a gift or an interest and don't get to cultivate it. Something gets in their way. And so there's probably a whole lot of unrealized unre creativity and potential out there. And I guess that is a really good way to look at it. It's how, how anyone can activate their potential as a human being. I was very fortunate to have some ability in the arts space and I was very fortunate to have parents always encouraged and supported me in that, in that journey. But I think on reflection, one of the really important things for me personally was um, I just kind of grew up, I was, I was never much good at anything as a kid. Right? I was never much good at anything. I was always a kid that, you know, I was one of those kids who never got chosen for anything or I was always the wallflower. <clears throat> I was like a Mr. Invisible. And uh, I think when I got to my late teens, something kind of clicked in my brain and I just started to believe that I could do whatever I wanted to do, basically. And I think that's been my greatest gift in as much as... Um, and I'm not, I'm not being super modest here, but I don't see myself as, I, I do have art talent, I don't deny that, but I think coupled with my talent is just the belief that I can, I can draw really well or I can paint really well if I choose to. I believe in myself that way. And, and that's been a great asset for me. And, you know, Henry Ford had a great quote about, uh, there are those who believe they can and those who believe they can't. And they're both right. So, you know, believe you can and it becomes a possibility. Believe you can't and the game's over. So mindset, I think, is a really critical component in all of this. And when I started out on my journey on art, I wasn't a particularly good artist, but I, I was trying to find something I could be good at, you know, like I had to, had to be good at something. I just decided rather than to settle i'm not saying i'm like you know up there with the best but i decided that i was going to aim for the best and if i was going to be inspired by artists i was going to go and look for the world's best wildlife artists i was going to try and be as good as them so i was never interested in mediocrity it's always a learning journey there's always more to learn there's always space to get better and so um i think the fact that um, you constantly strive to improve, you constantly strive to grow, yeah. and you constantly believe that you can achieve those things are as important as having some real talent. And in some ways, that's actually part of a part of part of a talent stack. But so what would you say to someone who probably has a little voice in their head that's telling them, you know, maybe you've got an ability in this area, and they're kind of like part of them is wanting to expand that, but then there is the other the other voice going, no, nah. kind of deluding yourself or, you know, that's that nagging self doubt that what would you say, what would you say to them to, to overcome that self doubt and that fear? And, and I would imagine, okay, we're talking specifically about, about art and wildlife art, which is your expertise, but I would suggest that this would probably be applicable in, in, in not just creativity incidentally, but any human endeavor. I think follow Follow your passion, you know, if something, if something excites you, something stirs you, something, listen to that voice. When you follow that, you get into kind of an alignment with what's important to you, what makes you passionate, what gives you a sense of purpose. So try, don't listen to the negative voices. You know, all through life, you're going to get negative voices, whether they're your own or other people's. And unless it's your parents saying, you know, don't leap off that cliff without thinking about it. There's times to listen to a negative voice. <laughs> but, but in this sort of thing, you know, the pathway is either going to be you're going to spend your life wishing you tried. What's the worst that could happen if you give it a go, you know? So if it's something that 
you feel a connection with, something that resonates with you, then follow it. And it may not turn out to be anything great, but at least you can say, well, I tried. And I can at least know that it wasn't for me, it wasn't any good, but I'm not going to go through life going, if only I had tried that, if only, if only. So you don't want to, you don't want to end up with those kind of regrets. But followed it. And for me, it was a case of, um, you know, if you're interested in creativity and you've got a, something you're interested, in, go and look at the people who are the absolute best in their field and don't let them put you off that they're so good. Just recognize that they started where you were at one stage, you know, and it's through just their passion and hard work that they got from where they, where you might be today to where they are. There is a pathway between those two places and be inspired by them and say, how amazing. Wouldn't it be great to be able to do something so, so interesting or so fulfilling or whatever it is, something that brings joy to other people. So follow the inspiration, follow, follow the positivity, I'd say. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic and really good advice. Now, to give people uh, the context, like, um, let's talk about your art and you, a pretty well-renowned uh, you know, wildlife artist. Tell me about what you do. Well, my art is really, um, you know, when I was in high school, I, I grew up in South Africa, and which, of course, is a really amazing place to get inspired by nature. And um, I was always interested in nature and when I got to high school, I had to choose between art or biology. And so um, I chose biology because I was really passionate about learning more about nature. And, and I, um, I didn't see too much in the art space that I found particularly inspiring back then anyway. So, so my career has always been around the science side of things and conservation and working around trying to make some small contribution to that space. And my art has always been something that's kind of sat in the background, I suppose, <clears throat> as a kind of semi-professional hobby, I suppose you could call it. So it was something that I had to squeeze in <clears throat> in between my day job and other interests. And um, which is, which is um, why I'm, you know, my reason why I'm not a multimillionaire artist at the moment is because it's something I squeeze in between my all the other things I do. Um, small joke there, but <laughs> um, yeah. So, so I learned through observation mostly. Same when I finished school, I went to university and I had a look at the art at the university and I didn't really do anything for me. Um, you know, as, a, as someone interested in natural history, I'm, I'm more interested in kind of real, realistic art and um, it's quite funny because wildlife art as a genre generally isn't taken that seriously by the art world. Um, I, I went to the Cairns Regional Gallery a couple of years ago to see if they might be interested in, in showing um, my work and they were not interested in the slightest. Um, they do show a little bit of wildlife art occasionally, but for some reason wildlife art often gets seen as something other you know, there's all sorts of, if you draw, if you draw, if I paint a portrait of you, it goes up as fine art, but if I paint a portrait of a zebra, it's, it's wildlife art, it's not fine art. So there's a weird distinction in the art world sometimes about what fine art is and, and, and what wildlife art is, in my opinion. And that, that might be why I kind of stay out of the art world to large degree. I don't really dabble in that space. I just do my thing. But in terms of um, learning how to be an artist, that was really through just looking at the work of people who I thought were really fantastic wildlife artists and kind of deconstructing how they painted. And I really used to sit down and make a lot of notes, pull the painting apart, how they've composed it, what kind of colors they've used or devices have used to lead the viewer's eye around. And when you compose a lot of my art, I suppose you could divide my art into two main areas. There's a lot of fairly just straightforward portraiture of animals because I just think I'm just trying to convey the beauty of nature. And then when I get time, I try and do more complex compositions of animals in, in habitat. And it's very similar to creating a piece of music in a way, um, because there's, you're trying to bring in a lot of flavors and dynamics and 
warms and colds and lights and darks and lead people through it. So there's a lot of parallels between art and music in that kind of composition space. And it's quite an interesting and challenging space when you get into doing composition because you get one little element right and the whole thing just falls flat on its face. But that was really just learning through studying the art of other good artists. I think half the reason why there is this distinction between natural art and the and your sort of art is because a lot of it is about human expression, the message. And, and I mean, no disrespect to anyone who engages in anything creative. There, there's some art that, frankly, I'm not a great fan of. Even some, like, you know, really high, some celebrated artists, I look at their stuff, and it's just rubbish. And, and people kind of say, well, it's about the message and this person's self-expression. And I kind of I do get a bit of that. But what I'm looking for is beauty. And I think because your art, like that could almost be a photograph, seriously, what, what you, that, that's how good it is. But in some ways, the fact that it's so close to a photograph is a bad thing because people are like, well, you could take a photograph. And when I look at your work, I'm reminded of Carrie Baggio because of the lighting, because you really play with light. And that's, I, I think, that, and that, that painting behind you is just a perfect example of that. Like that could be, you know, you think you think Carrie Vaggio is the you know, beheading of St. Matthew or, or something like that, where you have this light in a particular area to draw your eye to, to a particular thing. And that's what, you've, you, that's what you've done with that. Like you've got different parts of the birds that, 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 that are lighted. And mate, it's, it's so, I'm sorry. I'm going to get all fanboy here. It's so well done. It's so cool. Would you mind flicking us through a couple of, of you know, just a, cu a couple of your other, you know, in the background and just running running through what they are and how you painted them and, and what you're thinking and, and all that. Yeah, stuff. sure. Thank you. And look, I'm so pleased you said that because I'm a massive fan of the old masters. And, um, you know, there was uh, a huge amount of discipline required in those days, right from the beginning of grinding and mixing your own paints, uh, although a lot of them had, you know, apprentices to help them with that sort of stuff. But, and they painted in these crazy conditions. They didn't have lamps and they had the candles poke, in a pokey room somewhere. So often they got that really dramatic lighting, but um, absolute geniuses, you know, like the work those, those people did under those conditions is just astounding and really beautiful. And I do love that light and dark play. And I'm, I'm really glad you picked that up because it's something um, I've only got a few pieces where I've really played with in the wildlife space, but it's something I'm very interested in applying in the wildlife context because it's, you do see it, but it's not that common. This was done in oils and it's a little pair of muscular kangaroos that used to live outside our kitchen when we lived up in Coranda. And they'd come out every morning and feed away on bits of rainforest fruit and so on. Beautiful little animals. They are uh, the smallest member of the kangaroo family and they come out during the daytime. Really gorgeous little guys. So, um, yeah, I was trying to do that light dark thing because it's obviously a great, um, it, it suits the rainforest situation really well. And this is similar, but this is a still life. Again, using that light and dark, um, just the bowl of pump, a basket of pumpkins, basically. But it's really nice to play with those dark darks and, you know, you get all those beautiful rich tones come out in the light areas. So that's, that's oils as well. More recently, depending on where I am and how much time I've got, I do work a lot in pencil as well. Pencil is a really nice medium to work in. And it's easy because you can just put it down and pick it up again with paints. You've always got to remix colors and it's a bit more of a complex process. So it's better suited to, um, when you've got a lot more time and so on on your hands. But I've been doing quite a lot of, uh, like a bit of a series on African wildlife. I was fortunate to go back home two years ago and spend some time in Botswana with my fantastic cousin, Stephen, just out in the bush for eight days. And we managed to get a lot of really great reference material for some art. So, um, so this guy's a, um, a bull elephant up in the Marimi National Park in Botswana. He was just Beautiful uh, hot day, just having a nice splash in the waterfall. And um, so I do enjoy getting into, I really enjoy capturing the tex texture of fur or skin and, um, 
and you know the contrast of that kind of tough leathery skin with the the water just creates a nice play and try and bring a bit of movement and dynamic into the picture as well uh, so in that sort of african theme i did a few others as well giraffes are these really crazy animals they're such a hodgepodge of shapes Matt, one of the really amazing things about nature is whatever it does kind of looks amazing. So it throws together the weirdest shapes and textures and colors and out comes something that, like if we did it, it would just look really dumb and stupid. But when nature does it, it's somehow it's beautiful and it works. And giraffes are just the most amazingly graceful, uh, beautiful animals. So um, this is a bit of a homage to, to what amazing and beautiful animals they are. Um, and then in that similar theme, more recently, I've just done a, I do, lions are my favorite animals. They're kind of my totem if I was to have such a thing. And um, so I love the way that, uh, this guy's got a relatively friendly face, but when lions look at you, it's like they're reaching out and grabbing you with their eyes. They just lock onto you and it's almost like a physical connection. And it can be pretty intimidating, of course, but, um, just the most amazing animals, just incredible beasts. So always, always beautiful straw, but she's got a bloody lot of hair. <laughs> it's like when I was drawing it, I was like, not another, not another hair. Too many hairs, your majesty. But anyway, all good fun. So we can in pencil. I tried some colored pencil a little while ago and I was really surprised what you can achieve with colored pencil. So. I do a lot of African stuff and also like to counterbalance that with some Australian wildlife. Australia's got obviously, you know, some really special, beautiful wildlife. And this was one I did for a book a while ago. Um, a group of us did a little book on the rainforest up here called Amongst Trees and I was fortunate enough to, to contribute a few pictures. So this one's um, a couple of frogs, a little zoo's frog and a, a northern bard. And that's done in uh, gouache and watercolor. And um, a little dragon done in gouache as well. So it's not, I do like to try and, there's a lot of groups that don't get represented that well in, in art, things like lizards and frogs and so on. So it's nice to kind of pick them up and, and just, you know, because everything when you stop and look at it is amazing. Like, you know, everything you stop and look at is miraculous, really. It's beautiful, it does incredible things. And it's, I guess what I'm trying to do with my art is kind of say, just stop and look at this thing and just realize how incredibly amazing and beautiful it is. You know, we're surrounded by miracles and beauty all the time. This one is a couple of double eyed big parrots. And I tried to, we we're talking about the old masters. Before oil paints were invented, they used to use something called egg tempera, which is basically raw pigment mixed with egg yolk mm. and they painted and I did this in egg tempera. It's a very kind of slow, tedious process because you can't lay down big amounts of paint, but you can get beautiful um, luminosity with it. And so um, I don't know if there's too many wildlife paintings out there done in egg tempera, but that was, um, that was done in that medium. Then uh, again, quite a different style. This was more of a stylized when I worked at the Kansas Pond North Environment Center years ago, I did this as a bit of a graphic we could use to, to raise awareness around cassowaries, essentially. So it was a very a more, much more stylized graphic kind of painting done in gouache. And gouache is just an opaque form of watercolor. It's not a very big picture with some kind of sporum fruit. I do like botanical art, and these are some kapok. Um, or flowers and seeds just on that drive you got Port Douglas they flower and fruit along there and they're just so yummy to look at you know visually just such a delight so this is just watercolor with a bit of pencil in the background this is what I'm working on at the moment so this is this is oils as well and I thought you know I've never painted well I've never really painted any fish so it's um hopefully you can tell it's very Monday <laughs> Back to the drawing board if you can't. But I'm trying to create this scene of, you know, down in the murky, under the roots. So I've still got a, you've still got a fair bit of work to do on it, but it's a big old girl coming out between the, the, the dead roots. And anyway, it's, it's 
quite fun, but it's one that's been parked a little while until I um, have a better chance to sit down and paint. And then um, I am quite interested in getting into uh, painting and drawing people as well. So capturing the human face is quite a challenge. I thought I'd start with a, a really difficult one and get, <laughs> and then, uh, but it is, it's fascinating. The human, the human body and the human face is just endlessly beautiful and fascinating to draw. So I'm trying to move into a bit of portraiture as well. There we go. Quick tour of some, some works. Mate, that's fantastic. How long does it take you to do? Oh, I'm not the fastest artist, uh, that's for sure. So my big pencil drawings, because I do, I do them at a reasonable size. That, that elephant, for example, is um, about 60 centimetres high by about 80. And there's probably about 100 hours worth of work in the original drawing. Um, so it's, it's a pretty slow process, especially for me. Yeah, other artists uh, certainly work faster than that i'm sure you you told us you know you got kind of serious in your in your early 20s but when did you first start i was about 14 and i remember my um my brother's very good at lots of things and he did a drawing and my mum went oh wow all that looks fantastic you know and there's that part of me that went bloody hell you know i want to do i want to do something good so i, I sat down and i drew i think it was a leopard's head and um, my mum went, oh, wow, you know, I think you, you can draw. You should do some more. And it was just that bit of positive feedback, I suppose. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll, keep, I'll keep doing it. And I enjoyed it. And, yeah, I, I seem to have a bit of an uh, ability to keep going there. So it was... It's very satisfying. It's a really satisfying process. It's, it's a bit of, you disappear from the world when you draw. Everything else, uh, it's kind of, it's a bit like meditation. And it's satisfying when you're able to achieve the results you're trying to get. You know, uh, to replicate the beauty of something on the page and make it look three-dimensional and give it character and depth and color and what, whatever else. Yeah, You're so definitely. right. And, and we do forget that we're just surrounded by miracles. And, and that's at every stage, like both in the natural world and the fact that, you know, uh, two guys can have a talk over a Zoom thing and the lights are on and, you know, we live in a society that's relatively safe and, you know, there's, yeah. it's just the, the capacity human beings have to take absolute miracles, constant miracles, all of the time for granted, it, it kind of ne never ceases to astound me. But, but is there, was there a distinction between I like doing this and, oh, I've actually got talent. I could do something with this and, and make a quid. It's a good question. I think it might have been when I was at university, you know, drawing was, I've never thought of it in any other way other than just something I enjoy doing. And one of the zoologists there asked me to do some scientific drawings for them. Uh, they needed some beetles drawn for some publications. And that was the first time anyone had ever kind of paid me to draw. And I suppose that made me think, well, maybe I can make, you know, income out of it as well. So I did a fair bit of scientific illustration for a while. When I first came to Australia, I, I got a job at the Western Australian Herbarium, uh, partly as a research assistant and partly as a botanical illustrator so I did a lot of um, pen and ink drawings for the floor of the Kimberley region in particular and a whole lot of stuff on acacias uh, one of the things about doing natural history art is it's it does combine not just your artistic ability but mm -hmm. a knowledge of your subjects in a way that um, some other disciplines might not demand so when you're doing scientific illustrations for example everything has to be accurate yeah. you know there's no room to be inaccurate so people are using it for very precise purposes and even when you do wildlife art you have to get everything right like i i've seen some interesting wildlife i remember seeing a picture of uh, someone had done this beautifully executed drawing of a, a young elephant suckling off its mother but it was suckling using its trunk and 
young elephants don't drink with their trunk they drink with their mouth you know yeah. so if you know the animal you look at something like that and go it's great but it's wrong and so when you do wildlife stuff you have to get it right and um up up here of course we we were so lucky to have um that amazingly beautiful human and artist uh, bill cooper william t cooper who lived up on the tablelands here and I was, I was very fortunate to get to know bill and wendy and bill was an absolute consummate naturalist he just knew his plants and birds in particular so well and that came through in his art and you know he, he, i remember him saying one day you can if, if someone ever draws a or paints a cockatoo holding some fruit in its right claw it's wrong because they're left-handed you know so down to that level of detail you got to get everything right because there'll be somewhere out someone out there will look at it and go yeah no they don't do that or one of the nice things and challenges about wildlife art is it's not just the art it's knowing the subjects well enough and representing them accurately so that you are actually portraying how they would be and you're not you know putting errors in there that makes a couple of questions come into my head that the first quick one is i'm not asking for your specific financials but i mean could someone make a living out of this if they want to oh totally yeah in fact i'd say wildlife art's one of the better areas to try and make an income out of art now you've got a reasonable amount of talent and you know how to market yourself you can make a very comfortable income and some of the the best wildlife artists out there are, are, are multi-millionaires from their art there's a um, there is a great demand for natural history art in, in some parts of the world. So it's um, definitely a, an area that people can make a, a living out of. You talked about William T. Cooper, who I'm a bit of a, I'm a, bit of a fan of. And for those who don't know, I'll be putting up a, a hyperlink. He recently had an exhibition here in the, in the Cairns Gallery, and that was absolutely spectacular to, to have a man of that, of, of that talent like living up here and doing that sort of stuff. Was he a bit of a mentor to you? And before him, did you have someone encouraging or mentoring you? Oh, yeah. Look, Bill was, uh, I think, an inspiration to so many artists. And I, I knew his work from a long time ago because he did um, a very famous book called Parrots of the World where he systematically went through and beautifully illustrated every species of parrot, male and female, uh, in their habitat. Incredible body of work and uh, when we moved up here I was um, just delighted to find out he lived up the hill and um, I was very very fortunate to get to know Bill. beautiful beautiful man incredibly humble I'd say I'd say Bill definitely um, hard to find anyone who can paint birds or botanical subject matter better than Bill Cooper he really absolutely nailed it and um, so a huge mentor, huge inspiration. And when you said at the beginning, um, it looks like a photograph. It's, I'll be honest, when people tell me my art looks like a photograph, it's like someone burst my balloon inside because I don't want it to look like a photograph. I want it to look like art, but good enough that, you know, you can tell what it is. But the simple yeah. fact is, it's that, that's why wildlife art is devalued. There is a kind of field of art which is kind of hyper realism and which is really trying to almost make your art look like a photograph and it's technically amazing but it's not art that like i'm more interested in um something that actually when you stand hopefully when you stand up and look at my art you can see it's art not a photograph i don't want to try and pretend that i can draw something like a photograph but i want to be able to draw it accurately and realistically but still have some flavor of art and for me, that's still part of my learning and journey as an artist. Um, less is more. And the great artists know what to leave out because a good painting is a kind of a dance between the artist and the viewer. You know, there's bits that aren't there and it's up to the viewer's brain to engage and fill in those missing pieces. And in that engagement, they kind of co-create the, the work. And um, that's part of my journey and, and challenge as an artist is to to resist the temptation to put everything in, but leave enough out that the viewer can co-create the picture, depending on what you're trying to do. But that's that's um, it's an interesting space. And also, of course, ca capturing the spirit of the animal. Like it's particularly easy, and we'll use an obvious, easy example, like the predators you were talking about before. It's like that. Ah, 
you know what I mean? You capture it. You're capturing the fact that this is a powerful predator. That if it really just decided your lunch, and there's something deep within inside you that is going that thing, that thing is both terrifying, but I'm drawn to it at the same time. I just can't stop looking at it. In in essence, you're capturing the spirit of the animal, and I mean that in the religious sense. Yeah. That's what that's what you're capturing. The magnificence of the magnificence of that creature. No, you're absolutely right. There's, you know, everything has kind of a life, a life force, a life energy. And to me, that's a great compliment. If, when people come in and say to me that, oh, you've captured, you know, the essence or the character of something, that that really makes my heart sing. Because that's what, they, like you said, that's really what you're trying to do. More than just the physical, it's that that deeper sense of what what that. That animal that creature is what it represents and it's the energy it has the way it is in the world and you want to con- convey that as well so yeah i'm always feel very happy with people so do i prefer drawing or painting yeah it's um it really depends on what the subject is and i like to use a whole range of different media as well so i'm not just an oil painter like depending on what i'm doing I'll work in any medium. So it, it really depends on what I'm trying to achieve and the effects I'm trying to get. But my two favorite mediums are oils and pencils, the kind of two ends of the spectrum. The pencils are just beautifully simple, raw, kind of a naked pigment. You know, it's just shades of gray. And, and, and yet you can still create so much um, character and texture and, and life, just just some lead. Uh, through to oils, which is this beautiful, very lush. You can get some really beautiful qualities and depths and uh, resonance with oils. So those are my two favorite mediums um, for very different reasons. If someone wants to get a painting off you or... Um, I do have a little website. It's johnjrainbird.com.au. Um, my middle name's James. This is John J. Rainbird. Uh, so I have a website. You can go and have a look at um, most of my arts up there. You can you know, contact me through that. I do. Uh, I pop down to Palm Cove once a month and have a little stall there and um, sell prints. And I also have a, a Facebook page where I pop casual bits of art, and also under uh, John J. Rainbird Art. So yeah, any of those avenues. And I sell prints, I sell originals, I do commissions. And, and you know, the thing that also makes my heart sing is, that, you know, uh, I love it when a piece goes off to someone and they absolutely, like, they're so wrapped. And um, I've got a few people who will come by occasionally or, or bought a piece and they go, every time we walk into that room, we just, like, love that. You know, and that, the, the fact that it's bringing joy to people is so rewarding for me like that's it's it's like the best reward i could ever get is knowing that this when people look at something it's it's bringing an an emotional response in them where they're just feeling happy or wow what an incredible animal whatever it is so that's that's uh that's the best reward for me is when people come and tell me that story so yeah 